Hey class, how you doing? So I wanted to reinvigorate and start the sort of weekly news cycle that I used to do over the summer. Uh, my apologies for it taking um, a little bit of time to get, you know, off the ground, but here we are. Uh, and so let us kind of jump into some, uh, you know, modern topics in the news, kind of have a discussion, get the ball rolling. Um, I understand that some of my um, students don't necessarily read the news all the time. Uh, which I can't blame you just because it feels like we are getting bombarded on a daily basis with news, um, either from social media, um, TV, our parents, whatever. Uh, but at least let's just have, you know, for a few minutes, a general sort of update and consensus on some of the news. Um, and I will put this on, of course, my, you know, YouTube channel um, and put it within sort of our discussion board, right? And then feel free just to um, keep commenting and we could have an open discussion about it. Uh, so I guess I can call this Scribs Weekly News Chat or something along those lines, whatever you want to call it, it's fine by me. Uh, and so I just, you know, started to search the web just for all, you know, the recent things that I've been noticing throughout the various news channels, whether liberal, conservative, or, or in between. Some US, some world, um, but all relevant um, in today's day and age. Uh, so let's start off with mail-in voting ballots. I know there's been you know a lot of speculation recently with uh, you know both sides of the political aisle kind of saying things about mail-in voting. A few of my students uh, during our uh, office hours and lectures have been saying or asking questions about mail-in voting and is it fraudulent and what's just going on. Uh, so mail-in voting has been around since the Civil War, actually, when a lot of the northern troops were um, going onward towards the battlefield. Uh, and so even here in this Nat Geo article, they were detailing how a lot of the uh, sort of uh, controversy right, surrounding it um, was that, you know, Republicans at the time from the north were uh, supporting it. But Democrats feared that the uh, military leadership was going to tamper with the results very similar to now, but kind of the roles are switched. And so right now, the Trump slash Republican administration is saying that, well, you know, maybe mail in voting is going to be very fraudulent. And we don't know how many illegal immigrants are going to double dip and yada, yada, yada. Uh, and so that fear has apparently been in the United States for quite a long time. And it's not going away. But all of the polls and studies that I have read, uh, you know, kind of objectively based uh there although there technically is you know double dipping double voting uh going on in the u.s for let's say mail-in uh, ballots it's such a small percentage that it does not really do a lot of damage uh and so i personally will think that it's actually a to a greater benefit to have a, the larger percentage of the population actually engage in the voting process because as it is it's you know the voting rate is kind of abysmal uh, compared to the rest of the world we always have you know 20 30 to 30, uh, plus percent right of the u.s population just not voting at all and so um, it definitely in my opinion would be a very sort of american patriotic thing uh, to have people you know geared up to vote and mail-in ba ballots are very easy i've been voting since i was 18 and all of my ballots have been uh, mail-in voting so it's very convenient very easy um, and, you know, kind of gets everyone involved in the process. Um, so let me know what you think. Um, but to play devil's advocate uh, in Georgia, you know, like I said, there are always some reports of some uh, di double dipping or mishaps um, or perhaps clerical errors. Uh, people are not perfect. God knows that governmental bureaucracies are not perfect. And so, you know, I, I believe even when I was younger, um, the Bush versus Gore uh, election, something in Florida that you know, they were finding a bunch of quote unquote dead people that had been voting uh, or something to that effect, um, just because the um, record offices hadn't updated that these people were deceased already, but their family members vote on, the, on their behalf, whatever. There's always some small things that always go on to this nature. But like even in Georgia here, they found 1000 people voted twice in the primary or something like that. Yeah, but, you know, a thousand people out of millions, you know, it's it's you know, what, what are we really after here? Obviously, the, you know, they're say, saying we will prosecute. We don't want this to happen, of course. But, you know, let's just kind of uh, put things into context. You know, let's not overreact or be brash. Um, but speaking of overreacting potentially or being brash or perhaps not overreacting enough, um, the California fires 
um, have turned California into an absolute hellscape. This is Northern California. This is the Golden State Bridge. Some of my friends right now that are going to um, Berkeley um, for their um, sort of PhDs and doctorates um, all over my own Instagram, uh, they've been posting up photos and videos of just, you know, outside their apartments. And it's literally just a reddish hellscape. Um, if any of you are fans of Lord of the Rings, such as me, because I always have my Lord of the Rings poster in the back, uh, they always keep saying something to the effect of, oh, I, I didn't know that I was going to wake up in Mordor today, right? Um, and so just hellish looking. But this is a serious conversation. Uh, it seems as though every single year uh, our dry seasons are getting longer the temperatures in both los angeles and just california in general are like record breaking and you know the fires are becoming far more frequent and far more um deadly right and powerful uh as they're kind of spreading um i had a conversation about this with my parents uh maybe a day or two ago uh, with my dad in specific um and essentially we were you know chatting about like when when my family just moved here in the early 90s right so i grew up through the 90s and obviously 2000s and onward but when i was a kid in the 90s here growing up in la i remember that a hot summer would have been let's say 85 86 87 and then maybe for a couple of days it went up to like 92 and that was like whoa it's hot uh, and that's pretty much how it used to be. And then in the last number of years, like it's become normal now every summer. It's like, oh, it's going to be 110 degrees tomorrow in L.A. And I'm like, what? Um, and then we're getting reports of Woodland Hills. It hits 120. I mean, th this is like desert level, you know, temperatures. So global warming is definitely, you know, real. Um, yeah, these are the type of photos I keep seeing on my Instagram all the time. Um, you know, uh, global warming is definitely something that we have to be conscientious of. But you know, I don't know what the long term solution is going to be for all of this, but uh, it is definitely getting a lot more difficult for California to keep fighting these fires because they're just so num uh, numerous. I would hope and imagine that uh, the state of California is going to pass, uh, you know, emergency measures um, in order to get tens and tens of thousands of people into the firefighting service, uh, just because we need bodies out there, right, to actually, you know, uh, number one, prevent fires. Number two, to go through and kind of, um, uh, I know they do a bunch of those preventative measures. I, I don't know what the specific things are called because um, I haven't talked to my firefighter buddies in a long time. But uh, especially when you are fighting the fires, you need, you know, just people. Uh, and so hopefully we can get that, you know, process kind of started. I know that as a temporary solution, the state of California, uh, whenever the fires are getting very severe, uh, they keep getting um, state penitentiary inmates right to actually you know don on all of the outfits and they become volunteer firefighters and fighting the fires themselves uh and i believe that helps reduce their sentencing or something to that effect so kudos to them uh but yeah i definitely would highly advocate for the state of california to like streamline the process a bit more um so going from state news let's kind of jump to federal news shall we uh, we're having some more drama with the Trump administration. Surprise, surprise. I know the last few years, the Trump administration, everything's been quiet and it's been a really nice administration. My sarcasm is heavy there. Um, but once again, we have something, you know, pop up. So we have the whistleblower says that the top DHS or Department of Homeland Security officials distorted Intel to match Trump's statements. They are lying to Congress. Uh, so what regard, whether the whistleblower is correct in this or not, uh, I am unsure. Uh, you know, we always have to take with a grain of salt and obviously go into investigation. Uh, but, you know, if this is true, then, you know, the Trump administration has, of course, dipped into their political agenda, tried to manipulate some intelligence reports, uh, you know, with like Russian uh, interference, right? And uh, any kind of like election tampering. So, uh, you know, it's getting very shady nowadays, right? A number of years ago, if anything close to this would have popped into the news, I specifically remember both sides um, of the political aisle would have been in an uproar, right? Saying this is un-American, like what's happening? Now, for some reason, it just seems that uh, either side of the you know political aisle, right? They're just kind of doing whatever they need to do or saying whatever they need to do to just keep their guy in power. Uh, and I think that's the wrong, wrong message um, to send. 
and uh, honestly, it's deteriorating the sort of national unity of uh, the United States. Um, further, right, same thing, whistleblower alleges that they told him to stop reporting on the Russia threat. Um, and so I keep uh, seeing this quite often uh, because recently in the last couple of months, there's been articles on articles about how China, India, and Russia, right, keep trying to interfere in U.S. elections, uh, going into our social media accounts. Facebook uh, from the 2016 election was getting bombarded by uh, like Russian hackers and sort of like catfishing um, like accounts, right, kind of just going in the chats and just starting stuff. Uh, and so Facebook as a social media company, I still remember a little while ago, right, they had a, a congressional sort of panel asking Facebook, like, well, what are you going to do? Because this is overlapping with national security uh and so it's a very interesting conversation also to have of you know number one uh is the u.s going to ramp up their sort of anti-cyber security number two if let's say foreign powers are bombarding our social media right our instagrams our snapchats our facebooks for most of you not facebook that's what your parents use now but you know tiktoks whatever uh if, there's, if they start to bombard and influence those, is that necessarily a, you know, attack on our electoral processes if they're just influencing us, right? And like, where does the overlapping start and end? And where's the final cutoff? You know, so it's very gray, murky area. But I feel that Congress really needs to just modernize the uh, laws and kind of step up their game because life is just super quick, right? And it's just modernizing faster and faster right now. Uh, and so I know it's not typically government's strong suit to pass things very quickly. But in this case scenario, I think they definitely kind of need to, you know, ramp it up a bit. Uh, speaking of government, Mr. Dr. Fauci. Uh, and so I've been seeing, you know, a few, uh, you know, uh, news titles about this as well on the vaccine. When is the vaccine going to come out? Uh, a bunch of my students, right, always ask me as well, when wh when are we going back to school on campus? My answer th to that is, I don't know. But if uh, Dr. Fauci uh, has anything to say about it, uh, they're saying probably by, um, uh, you know, next year, sometime, whenever that's going to be, uh, maybe as early as 2021, maybe by mid-2021, whatever, they could have vaccines rolling out. Uh, and so I think it's safe to say maybe by next fall, we could go back to school as normal and life can kind of go back to normal. Just because even today, I received a LA Times notification. Halloween is canceled. That is the first time in my life I have ever heard such a thing, right? Blasphemy. Uh, but hopefully next fall will be a little better. Uh, but yes, definitely the vaccine needs to go through its trial process. I believe they're already finished with all of their animal testing. Uh, they need to progress right now to human trials and testing and kind of have their sample sizes and do everything correctly, right, for the FDA. Because I believe Dr. Fauci one time in one of his uh, interviews was saying that, uh, you know, it's it's all fun and good to try to pump out a vaccine as quick as possible, but you have to make sure there are n no side effects. Just because even if it's a small side effect to like 1% or 2% of the population, that's going to affect hundreds of thousands, if not millions of individuals. Uh, and so they could actually have a worse reaction to COVID or the flu or whatever if you give them vaccine. So you have to just make sure it's very, very safe. Um, and so, yeah, still waiting on the vaccine. But um, Harvard and a few others have been making polls recently for like school based vaccines or just vaccines in general. And so the main thing that I've been kind of reading about is that there's a supposed sort of lack of trust in the vaccine uh, safety. Right. Um, and its efficacy. And so it, there's been polls here and there uh, ranging in numbers and, of course, demographics and age groups uh, and such, et cetera. But uh, the consensus was, from what I could gather from from today, from what is it, September 9th, uh, if the vaccine is going to come out earlier, uh, people are going to be less uh, trusting. If the vaccine is going to come out a little later after more testing and you know trials and etc they're going to be a little more trusting about it and there's obviously a huge chunk of the percentage of people that were just saying that uh you know even if it comes out i'll wait a little bit right <laughs> i'll see if anybody's gonna have a horrible reaction to it um and so uh, yeah the the whole vaccine thing it's it's gonna happen eventually i know we're going to have one eventually it's just a matter of time so we all just have to hunker down but and i don't have a uh, a news article on this one 
uh, on this point that I want to make. But it is a valid point uh, on some of the more conservative sites and the conservative voices that, you know, let's say I can research sometimes because I do like to have a healthy balance between liberal, conservative and just moderates in the middle. Right. I never like to just, uh, you know, hammer down the liberal perspective down your throats. That's not what America is. That's not what life is. And uh, the conservatives are saying, why are all of the big news channels, especially, let's say, more of the liberal ones like CNN or whatever else, they're not really advocating for the economic argument and just reopening up life just because right now we are up to what 45 or 50 million unemployed uh, and many people are hurting financially and so the conservative argument there is yes the the uh, virus is a you know a threat but a more realistic threat for today or perhaps an even bigger threat is you know poverty Right. So if you had a small business and it just literally got wiped out in the last few months, you lost all your, you lost your business, you lost your investments. Maybe right now you're going to lose your house as well. You have no income coming in. That's going to be a more scary reality than potentially getting COVID and getting sick. Right. And so the argument there would be open up life again. But anybody that, let's say, has some pre-existing conditions, if you're diabetic. Right. Um, if you have, uh, you know, uh, large weight issues, right? Or uh, let's say you used to have cancer back in the day, whatever, right? Very sort of big markers, uh, then you should be very careful, right? And kind of try to isolate a little bit more until vaccines come out. And so, you know, I keep hearing that or this argument back and forth between liberals and conservatives, but you know, there's no sort of just normal voice or consensus in the middle. And I understand both. I really do. Uh, At home right now, I have, you know, two elderly grandparents, Right. My grandmother is fighting Alzheimer's. My grandfather just finished a few months of um, you know, chemotherapy, battling uh, cancer. So he's he's on the better now. He's on the mend. But, you know, if COVID hits either of them, they're probably done for. So I completely understand with the liberal argument. At the same time, you know, some of my friends are completely out of work. Because, you know, the business is shut down. Right. Or their bar shut down or whatever. And uh, or their you know, hair salons shut down. And so I completely understand that side of the argument, too. And they're like, George, we lost thousands of dollars a month of income. Like, what am I supposed to do? We have one stimulus check and boom, like that was it. It's not enough to live off of. So it's a very it's a very interesting conversation to have, really. Um, and so I don't know what the exact solution might be, but. Yeah. Uh, speaking of relief bills. The GOP's skinny, quote unquote, uh, coronavirus relief bill does not include a second round of stimulus checks. This kind of goes into that economic argument that I was talking about. One round of stimulus checks is not enough. Um, One month or even two months of income is not enough for people. Um, Because I remember early, right, like it was what, February, March. They're like, oh, just one month of quarantine and all of this is going to pass. And now it's many, many months into quarantine. And so one round of stimulus checks is not going to do much. People need to, you know, get back to work. They need to start making money and earning again. Uh, And so once again, that economic argument really kind of plays into it. Uh, And so I don't know what the uh, solution might be. Maybe the middle ground solution is allow everyone to go back to work, but mandate everyone wears a mask, right? Hand uh, sanitization everywhere, et cetera. Anybody who's, uh, let's say, Uh, more high risk has to be extra careful. I don't know what the solution might be, but we definitely need to have a better conversation. But the you know, Congress has always just been in a grinding halt recently, which is not good. Uh, Moving on to a little bit international news, if I may, Uh, Mr. Boris Johnson back at it again, my goodness, that hair. Um, He's the British equivalent of Donald Trump, if I've ever seen one. It's just it's so funny at the same exact time. The rise of Donald Trump saw the rise of uh, Boris, uh, Boris Johnson, and they literally look like cousins. It's just so funny to me. But anyways, sorry, I digress. Um, and so if you know, if you remember the news, right, Britain was supposed to have Brexit and peel away from the European Union. Uh, and so, you know, the way that they're doing that, I guess, supposedly now it's going to breach some international law. Right. And the way that they want to do it, uh, this kind of feeds into uh this feeds into topics that I cover in both my Santa Monica courses with ethnic uh, immigration right now and my world history classes at GCC. And I'll explain why. So 
the crux, I would say, of Brexit going back a few years, right? Uh, because some of you a few years ago just were not paying attention to the news. Uh, the crux of it is that a lot of Brits were feeling that the country was getting swarmed by immigrants, right? Uh, and so there was this sort of backlash of, well, Britain's not British anymore, right? It's getting diluted. Uh, and so they wanted to kind of take a step back, from my understanding, take a step back and kind of re british eyes everything, right? Have their own agreements, not be tied to the European Union any longer, especially because Britain used to be a major empire around the world, right? Going from top dog to, let's say, just playing nice with everybody, I guess they wanted to feel, you know, the, um, the sort of power and strength dynamics again. And so this is a common theme that we've just seen in history, um, you know, and especially as we're getting into like topics of, different countries and nation states and immigration um, and, you know, let's say, uh, you know, nativism, which is, you know, a fear of sort of new immigrants and things changing in your home country. Uh, these themes have never gone away and they're still reigning true today. Um, I know that some of my students, like as soon as you're reading some like, I don't know, let's say news like this, you're like, oh, well, how can they just be this terrible and uh, racist towards immigrants, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, these themes have just been across, you know, history. Uh, as soon as people start to feel as though their status quo and whatever they feel is normal at the time and, you know, whatever your normal life is, as soon as that's being affected in any way um, and major change is coming, right, you just feel uneasy. And so, you know, this is just kind of personified to a more extreme version, of course. Uh, but, yeah, we're going to start seeing more and more of this, right, either from the United States side or the, you know, uh, UK side. Italy is becoming a lot more sort of hunkered down. Brazil is becoming more hunkered down. And so as a historian, sometimes I'm looking at all of the sort of news reels right now and what leaders are being voted into office. And it honestly looks to me that, you know, around the world, people are sort of shifting back towards more nationalistic, um, closed borders, a little more conservative of a mindset. Um, it seems that the last 20 years or so, and for some of my students, that's like your entire lifespan, right? Um, the last like 20 years or so of globalization um, obviously has opened borders like crazy and just intermixed everything to, you know, extreme measures that the world has never seen. But obviously a lot of people now, they're just feeling a little put off by it. And so I think this is a sort of counter reaction towards it to kind of like hunker down a little bit, have more closed borders um, and kind of, I guess, preserve the national unity or identity to a certain extent. Uh, so yeah, well, I'll keep covering some of this and trying to find, you know, more things as we kind of go through the weeks. God knows 2020, every week is a new adventure. So I'm pretty sure I can find something on a weekly basis. Um, and then to kind of close things off, potential World War III, that's a fun topic, if I've ever seen one. <laughs> so uh, the main thing, uh, this was like from a few weeks ago, that it got a little more heated. Now it kind of calmed down, but uh, China and India... Um, on their border, we're kind of having a very kind of tense conflict um, and a skirmish, actually. Uh, and so that's very scary because both nations um, have the highest populations uh, in the world. Both nations have nuclear weapons. Uh, and so I do not want to see India and China getting into a slug out fest over like a small territorial dispute. Uh, that would not be great. Uh, although, you know, that would kind of, you know... Uh, that would preoccupy the, you know, the uh, Chinese and the Chinese government away from any sort of U.S. intervention, I guess, for a little bit temporarily. But there are no winners there. Um, there was this wonderful um, TED talk that I saw uh, a couple semesters ago. Uh, it was a nuclear physicist, and he used to work for the Reagan administration. He's an expert on anything nuclear, um, and especially weapons of mass destruction. And so he said that they were doing... Um, uh, sort of like a sim online simulations, right? And computer run generated simulations. And that uh, the simulations that they were doing was between India and Pakistan. And only a few nuclear weapons back and forth, let's say if they were to get into like a nuclear war, a few nukes blowing up at the same time, potentially, um, could tilt the world into, you know, a slight, let's say, temperature change or a nuclear winter or start something off like that. So um, it doesn't really have to take much, Um 
for us to kind of get into like a huge nuclear slugfest. God knows, as you know, going back towards our um, sort of California fires, right? Uh, we do not need more nukes and all of the sort of energy blasting into the atmosphere. Uh, if anything, we need to cool things down. Um, but yeah, hopefully things are going to be getting better. But uh, you know, as far as let's say China and India and even Russia coming up and up, um, I feel that like, once again, all these countries are slowly going back towards a, a more nationalistic, conservative sort of mindset and viewpoint. Uh, potentially, arguably, closer towards an older sort of imperial model, right, of territorial expansion. Uh, but that is to be still played out. Um, because let us not forget this entire sort of model of us being part of the United Nations. Every country is to be respected and unique and blah, blah, blah. That's a very, very early concept um, of being less than 100 years old. Previous to that, for centuries, we had big empires rule throughout the world. And so that's kind of been the model of rule. Uh, and so perhaps people or countries are kind of, you know, uh, falling back into that. I'm unsure, but I just hope that things are going to be peaceful, obviously, and I hope we can all go back to school normally, um, hopefully by, you know, this time next year. Um, but that's all for my weekly news chat. Obviously, no homework on this. This is just me kind of just talking, hopefully not ranting, but just having an intellectual conversation. Uh, feel free in our discussion below to, you know, add your thoughts, add your comments. I would love for you to post um, like follow up articles or videos or something that I just, you know, missed um, this week. I'm all, uh, I'll try to post next week and the week after that and kind of moving forward as well, whatever I end up finding. But yeah, let's have a fun, interesting discussion about this. Um, I always love to hear your thoughts and opinions on it. Um, and I don't want this just to be, you know, uh, just strictly whatever our class is about, right? I kind of want to open up to other um, discussions and conversations as well. But with that being said, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for, uh, so much for listening. You're probably sick and tired of seeing uh, seeing me um, and listening to me, but I really do appreciate it if you are here and you actually stuck out with it. Uh, I'm signing off and I'll see you next time. Thanks so much.